This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. While the World Cup has ended, with Argentina defeating France in the finals, we turn now to look at a bribery scandal involving Qatar, the host of the World Cup that's rocked the European Parliament. Earlier this month, authorities in Belgium raided the homes and offices of European Parliament lawmakers, accusing them of accepting bribes from government officials in Qatar, as well as—and as, this isn't as um, uh, being reported as much—as uh, well as Morocco. The raids recovered hundreds of thousands of euros in cash. Among those arrested was the European Parliament vice president, Eva Kaili of Greece. In a lead-up to the World Cup, she repeatedly defended Qatar against critics who pointed to the monarchy's dismal record on workers' rights and its persecution of LGBTQ people. The scandals also exposed how Morocco has tried to lobby and bribe members of the European Parliament in an attempt to increase support for its illegal occupation of Western Sahara, which is known by many as Africa's last colony. Another person arrested was former European Parliament member Antonio Panzeri of Italy. He was accused of, quote, intervening politically with members working at the European Parliament for the benefit of Qatar and Morocco. We're joined now by two guests. Francesco Battagli is a former United Nations mission and special representative of Kofi Annan for the Western Sahara. Ana Gomez is a retired Portuguese diplomat. She was a member of the European Parliament from 2004 to 2019, where she was part of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats. She's joining us from Portugal. Um, Ana Gomez, let's begin with you. Can ex you explain to a global audience what this investigation investigation is all about um, when it comes to both Qatar and not as well known to Morocco? Well, um, the, the authorities of Belgium, the judicial authorities of Belgium um, that have done this investigation, apparently led by um, uh, suspicions regarding uh, peddling of interests by Qatar through uh, a number of people, including uh, this vice president of the European Parliament, Eva Kaili, a uh, uh, Greek member of Parliament, and um, and other people, namely uh, um, working with a, a human rights NGO called uh, Fight Impunity that had been funded by a former, uh, the former MEP, Antonio Panzeri. The investigation regarding Qatar, the suspicions about Qatar, actually are leading more and more to the fact that there is a network operating in the European Parliament for long, actually um, established by Morocco. So Qatar is not the center of, of the investigation. It looks more and more that Morocco should be the center of this investigation, because, indeed, um, relatives, for instance, of Panzeri, the, the former MEP who, who established this NGO to cover up for this, for this um, uh, uh, corruption network, uh, Panzeri had his wife and his daughter arrested in Italy at the request of the judicial authorities of Belgium, because they were aware and they were benefiting since long from uh, uh, money sent by uh, Morocco. And, um, and uh, apparently, this is leading uh, to a network that was indeed established and directed by the Secret Service of, of Morocco. I am not surprised. I was not surprised. As soon as I heard that Mr. Panzeri was involved in this case regarding Qatar, I immediately suspicious, was suspicious and uh, said it publicly that this would lead to Morocco. Because for all these years, three mandates in which I have served in the European Parliament, served exactly together with Panzeri in the same political group, we had a, a number of, of disputes exactly because of uh, Western Sahara all the time. He was um, trying to protect the interests of Morocco, preventing that we would focus on human rights in Morocco itself and, of course, the human rights of the people of Western Sahara, which have their basic and number one human right, which is the right to self-determination violated by Morocco since long.
Um, I wanted to bring Francesco Batali into the conversation, <laughs> former U.N. Special Representative for Western Sahara. Um, talk more about—I mean, you've got the bribing of European Parliament members now behind bars uh, on Qatar workers' rights issues, stopping uh, resolutions going forward, condemning Qatar's human rights issues, and Morocco. Um, and talk about what this bribery has meant over the years, especially when it comes to trade agreements. And remember, you're talking to a global audience. Many are not even aware of Morocco's illegal occupation of Western Sahara. Sure. Thank you. Good morning. Um, just to um, reinforce what was said by the previous speaker, um, there is a cluster, a sort of group of friends um, revolving around the European Parliament uh, and parliamentarians themselves that for a long time have been channeling uh, this uh, illicit um, interests of, uh, of their sponsors uh, in a way to um, sustain their agendas within uh, the Parliament. On the part of Morocco, and this group of friends is very um, articulate in the sense, not just in terms of numbers or, or uh, you know, level or stature of the uh, participants, but they do a very thorough job. In other words, they don't just channel, you know, money or resources. They also facilitate the identification of parliamentarians that could be because of the nature of the functions and responsibilities within the parliament can be of greater use to, to their clients and uh, create occasions where these parliamentarians can be approached through social gathering, through uh, uh, visiting missions and so on. So it's a very articulate system, which includes also monitoring the behavior of parliamentarians that have been bribed to make sure that, you know, they vote or behave or lobby in line with uh, what is expected of them. Now, when it comes to Morocco, as uh, which was rightly said, uh, Morocco has a long tradition of a very aggressive uh, presence uh, both in terms of bilateral relations with key countries or in international fora such as the UN and the European Union in support of its agenda. Um, and this indeed has uh, had a tremendous impact uh, on two dimensions that have already been hinted. Uh, one, of course, in the um, sphere of economic and trade relations, and we are talking about the European Union in this particular instance, um, where um, uh, repeatedly, uh, though the uh, Morocco has been trying to uh, include the territory of Western Sahara in these uh, agricultural fisheries agreements with the European Union. This is very important because. Uh, uh, Western Sahara is uh, very rich in, uh, you know, um, fishing fields of, uh, of Western Sahara, among the richest in the world. Um, Western Sahara is a major producer of phosphates that are extremely important for the production of fertilizers and so on. So whenever uh, Morocco was signing any trade agreement with uh, the European Union, it was very important that these agreements should include the territory of Western Sahara. And uh, this is where the lobbying effort of the friends of Morocco became extremely important, so much so that twice the agreements between the European Union and Morocco included the territory and resources of Western Sahara, and twice the European Court nullified, declared these agreements invalid. And yet again, the parliament is reviving an effort to sign a fishery agreement with uh, Morocco, including Western Sahara. So the, uh, actually, there's also this attitude of the uh, European parliament is, uh, to say the least, uh, revealing of a certain extreme strength of Morocco in, the, in that forum. Now, on the question of Western Sahara, Western Sahara is a part of the greater lobbying effort of Morocco, not just in, uh, in, uh, in the EU, but also vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations, because basically what uh, we have in Western Sahara is an illegal occupation of a, of a former colony. When Spain left in uh, 75, 1975, Morocco occupied illegally, in collusion with the Spanish authority, the territory. Uh, under UN uh, Charter and international law, the Sahrawis should have been allowed a referendum for self-determination, which is the way it happened in many former colonies in Africa and elsewhere. 
This referendum was never held. Morocco doesn't allow this to be held, and it has since 1975 been occupying illegally this uh, territory. Um, so this is the context. In spite of that, and thanks to its lobbying effort, the Morocco has always been able to prevent the UN uh, to enforce uh, its obligation to allow for a self-determination uh, referendum, which are the main friends or supporter of Morocco in this uh, refusal to honor the international legality are the influential members of the Security Council, such as the United States and France. In Europe, Spain, the former colonial master, Western Sahara, is also is very supporting of uh, Morocco's uh, reluctance or refusal, indeed, to grant these people what is uh, owed to them. Um, speaking of 1975 and Morocco's illegal occupation of Western Sahara, Ana Gomez, um, that was the same year that Indonesia invaded East Timor, um, killing a third of the population, one of the worst genocides of the late 20th century. But the U.N. was able to sponsor a referendum in 1999 for East Timor. The people overwhelmingly voted for their freedom, and uh, Timor-Leste, uh, East Timor, is now an independent nation. Why has has the course of Western Sahara been so different? And is this bribery um, of European officials so a part of that? Stressed by the previous speaker, the role of uh, st some states, the United States, France, and Spain in particular, in protecting the regime in Morocco and in the um, in in supporting the regime in its uh, illegal occupation of Western Sahara. As I, I as a diplomat who have uh, worked a lot in the East Timor uh, liberation case, uh, when I entered the European Parliament in 2004, I was absolutely flabbergasted to see that uh, in the European Union people were treating um, Sahara as if didn't exist, as it was if it was part of Morocco, and it's as if international law, and namely the the, the right to self determination, would not exist. And I started protesting, and I was uh, um, often um, uh, uh, overruled, so to say, because uh, uh, we should not deny the interests of these uh, big states. And this was clear in these agreements on agriculture and on fisheries, that with the support of some members in the European Parliament, including myself, were brought to the courts, uh, European courts of justice, as it was mentioned, and the European Court of Justice very clearly established this was against international law. But still, there is this persistence. And yes, for that persistence, apart from the governments of these uh, European states, and of course, the protection of the United States as well, um, there are there is this network uh, inside the European Parliament trying to overrule people like myself, who who, who put forward the arguments of international law and of human rights, and also even the security aspect. I myself, I went to Morocco, I went to Tindouf, to the refugee camps of uh, uh, Sahrawis. I went to Layoun in a mission of the European Parliament, and I could sense um, the, the extreme security risks that uh, Europe in particular, but as well, of course, Africa and the world is facing by not helping this question of Western Sahara be settled as it was uh, settled in the case of Timor-Leste, with the right of the people to determine what they what they want for the future to be uh, properly asserted through a referendum, as it was done in, in Timor-Leste. It's been uh, Morocco all these years was obstructing the referendum. And I was particularly struck with this uh, security angle, because, of course, you can imagine that such a dispute and uh, um, uh, uh, generations of uh, um, uh, Sahrawis born in exile in Tindouf, in... Uh, uh, we in, just have 15 in, seconds. Yeah, you know... The dangers are tremendous that this uh, will be hijacked by some terrorist groups. And uh, so one more reason why Europe shouldn't uh, continue with this neglect for a, 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 conflict, a conflict that needs to be sorted out according to the UN um, rule and international law and, of course, human rights.
We're going to have to leave it there. Ana Gomez, retired Portuguese diplomat, former Portuguese ambassador to Indonesia and former member of the European Parliament, and Francesco Batali, former UN Special Representative in Western Sahara. That does it for our show. Go to democracynow.org for our documentaries on East Timor and Western Sahara. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.